Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher. Welcome back to Studio B. And in this video, I'm going to talk about the geometry of a drill. Now, it's very difficult to teach a class if you've got 24 kids sitting out here. Like, boys, this is the tip of a drill, and here are the angles that you need. You know, they absolutely could not see that, and they even couldn't see it very well if I had a larger drill, like this 7 8 drill, if I were to talk about the angles. So, because of that, I came up with a teaching aid that I made in 1980, so that's what, about 45 years ago? And this was sent to me by Kevin Lossy, who was a teacher, and I'm sure that he just found it there in a cabinet in his shop. So this is on loan. I do have to return this when I'm through with this video. Thank you, Kevin, for sending this very delicate item. Now, in the second part of the video, I'm going to talk all about how I made the model for this and then the mold. This is made of molding plaster and is very delicate. Some of you may have watched my other videos, and there's about three or four of them where I showed you how to sharpen a drill using these Vivor drill grinders. They're really great machines. Consider buying one. There'll be links in the description. But really what I wanted to do before I showed you how to grind, I, I really wanted to show the geometry of a drill tip like this. So I'm a little bit backwards here, but you can Watch this video and then go back and watch these if you haven't already seen them. Every drill has three parts. The shank, the main body, and the tip. And this is just the tip of a drill. So let's go over the parts of the drill tip. There's six, eight, ten of them. Some more important than the others. To start with, this groove right here is the flute. And the purpose of that is to allow chips to escape from the hole and lubricant to get down in the hole and the flute also helps create the correct geometry of a drill so that we have a cutting edge. I'm using the calipers here to show you that the distance between the two legs of the caliper is called the land and this is body clearance right here in black and in gray is called the margin so the margin is the only part that touches the side of the hole that you are drilling and we have body clearance here so that there just is not so much friction as you go in there and drill. This is not a cutting edge. It is on a reamer but not on a drill. The cutting edge is the lip which is right here. The very center portion of the drill and I put a little red mark on here is called the web and the web is really right where I'm pinching here and that goes down the full length of a drill and it gets thicker as you get toward the bottom. I did not do that in this model but I'll show you a picture of that a little bit later. So this is often called the chisel point and remember the chisel point does not do any cutting it only displaces metal so you want this to be as thin as possible, and I have talked about web thinning in some of the other videos. Now the web or the chisel point needs to be truly in the center of the drill. And if you're freehand sharpening often, the uh, dead center ends up being a little bit off to one side, and then you're going to drill oversize, or maybe only one lip is going to do the cutting. So it's very important that both lips be the same length and that the dead center or web truly be in the center of the drill. And this is the action of the drill, a right hand drill, with the lip here doing the cutting. In review, this is the cutting edge or the lip. This point right here is called the heel. Now we need to have an angle here of 8, 10, 12 degrees. It depends on the diameter of the drill. But you want the lip to meet the work first, not the heel. Otherwise you're just rubbing. So this angle that you see here, and which is maybe not even quite enough, 
is what we're after when we sharpen a drill. So we're trying to get both lips equal and the web in the center and 8, 10, 12 degrees of clearance here on the lip. All of those things are being done at once and that's what makes freehand drill sharpening so difficult. Most all jobber drills are ground at 59 degrees on each side. So using a drill gauge, check it like that, and we want 59 degrees. Now if you use the Vivor or other types of drill grinders, that's going to be produced automatically for you. But that is very, very important. So when I was in my prime, I made up a drill gauge out of cardboard or sheet metal just to show the class again that this is the angle that we're after, 59 degrees, or if you have another type of gauge, the included angle is 118 degrees. Well, that's the basic primer on the angles of a drill, and you, again, you need to know that before you attempt to sharpen it. Now, there are many little handbooks that show all of the different parts. I know you can't see that very well, but this is the Morse book. So read that, and every textbook that you come across, machine shop textbook, is going to have pictures like this. And study them and commit those angles and those part names to memory. So at the end of the video, I will have a bunch of pictures that you can look at that I'm taking out of these various shop books that I have here. So that completes this little primer on the angles and you already know how to drill, how to sharpen the drill from the other videos. But now in the second half I'm going to talk about, if anyone's interested, how I went about making this and I sold about 100 of them. It wasn't a big seller. Matter of fact it was an abject failure. But it's amazing that at least one of these has survived and there's probably some others that have survived that are in cabinets or shelves of schools around the country. Now these are made of plaster again and they are very delicate as you can see this one has been dropped or chipped. You can't let uh, students handle this, it's teacher only, but even some teachers can be pretty careless. Alright, so how did I make the original model? So how did I get the original shape? Well I took a picture out of a book, maybe not this one, cut that out and I put it on the copy machine at school and I blew it up until I got the di diameter that I wanted. So this is the shape I came up with and I made th this strictly for this video. The original model is long long gone. I don't know what happened to it. I'm sure I was so sick of it I threw it away. But anyway I traced this on however many pieces I needed about a quarter inch thick and I think I used that Luan plywood which gives you the slivers but this is walnut. Why am I using walnut? Because I got a ton of it. Anyway I went ahead and cut out there's about a dozen here but I, I, I had a lot more than this and then I put them this quarter inch hole in the middle six inch diameter and I put them on this is a quarter inch shaft here and then staggered them, like Stagger Lee. Remember Stagger Lee? Who sang Stagger Lee? Yes, Lloyd Price was the name. That's a worthless little bit of information, isn't it? But I liked that song when I was a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's how I did it. And I fiddled around until I got the right helix angle. I think I got too much helix angle right now. And I had it how high? Well, this high. I don't know how high that is. It's irrelevant. But I wanted it to be small enough so it didn't take a whole lot of plaster, wasn't too heavy to ship, and different uh, things like that are pretty important when you're designing a project, especially when it's going to be a failure. <laughs> So anyway, after I had these all stacked up, then I took Bondo, body putty, and I filled this in. Smoothed it off, sanded it, did a second coat, and matter of fact, there were probably ten coats all together. Or ten layers, until I truly got it pretty darn smooth. And then I had to proceed 
to put it on the on a big sander, that uh, delta sander, and grind the point, the geometry of the edge, the cutting edge, and all of that. So that is how I made that uh, the, the original wooden model. And then if there was any irregular, irregularities here, of course I sanded that smooth as well. And that was pretty easy to do after I had glued these. I forgot to tell you, at, at some point here I glued these together and they wouldn't come apart and it was easier to handle. Well, I had these staggered backwards. Matter of fact, I, it was a left hand drill there the last few minutes, but now we're back to right hand. I'm sure somebody already made a nasty comment. Some people don't finish a video. They, may, they stop and correct me and they do that to other people too. All right, now I had to make the margin, so I took, I think it was probably a paint paddle, something that had a little bit of flexibility. This is just a little bit too wide. And I proceeded to glue and nail this right on down the line. Do you know what I'm talking about? So that I had the margin. By the way, when I was done, I would dip this in shellac to seal it, and then I painted it flat black, and then by hand I painted the gray on here, which was quite tedious, and that was why I was kind of glad that it was a failure and I didn't have to make any more of these. That was a nightmare, really. So after the model was made and it was varnished and I put some parting compound on, it was a green stuff. I forgot what it was called, but it was covered with a parting compound. And then I had designed this size-wise such that it would fit in a container. Now, and it had to go in this way. Pretend this is wood now. But it had to be larger than this folder because I needed plenty of room for the rubber mold. So now I'm talking about making the rubber mold. This is the actual model or pattern. But we needed a rubber mold to pour the plaster in. And I used a rubber, it was two part rubber, called Black Tuffy. So, I, so this went in like that. And then I mixed the rubber, poured it in there, put it in under vacuum to get all the bubbles out. It would have been a little higher than this. And then, of course, I had to set a day or two, and then I cut the can off, threw the can away after I cut myself several times. And I then had to take a knife and cut the, the rubber to get the wooden pattern out of the rubber. But it was keyed so it would go back together and be accurate. Also, there was a mother mold. I don't think I'm going to... I'm talking too much about molds. So most of you aren't interested in how molds are made. But there was a mother mold so that when I poured the plaster in, it would retain its shape and not get distorted with the weight of the plaster. And the black toughy tended to distort and uh, submit itself to gravity over a period of time and lose some of its shape. Now my brother and I had quite a bit of experience with molding plaster because remember we made hundreds, even thousands of these plaster foundry patterns for the pro other projects that I made with Peterson Products. So I was used to working with plaster and that was the material that we used again because it was fairly cheap but it was delicate. And the whole idea here again was that the only teachers were to touch these or they would get chipped and damaged, and that was really important. Now, what happened to my original rubber mold and, and the rubber mo or, and the wooden model? Well, when you do something like this over a period of years, you really get sick of it. So, when I closed the business down in about 1992, I think it was, I burned everything. I can't tell you how glad I was to get rid of some of that stuff with no thought of ever making videos like I'm doing right now where I, I could reuse them. Okay, here's some extra credit for you. I told Kevin, pack this thing carefully so it doesn't get ruined by the post office. So he took two cans, as you can see here, and he put the plaster part in here and he used these rolled up t-shirts here. Maybe I can wear these. No, I got to return this to Kevin. So uh, to keep it from banging around and then he, the box was closed and he filled it with foam, I think from a spray can. 
It took me over 15 minutes to get this open, but it arrived in perfect condition with the packing, in spite of the fact that he put fragile on there, which only encourages them at the post office to drop kick. Sorry for that. No, I'm not. I've shown this brochure many times, but on this side are all ten of the foundry patterns that we sold. And then when it folded up, there are my teaching aids in both metric and standard. And this was the very last thing that I designed that I came up with. That's me in uh, 1980. It's pretty embarrassing, but I had my daughter take another picture of me, so you've seen that already, the, uh, the difference between then and now. So I was getting $25 for those in the 80s, which really was too cheap. That is me at school when I was in my natural prime. That concludes this video. Be sure and stick around. I've got a bunch of still pictures that I'm going to put at the end. I'll see you next time. Give me a thumbs up and subscribe if you're in the mood or, in fact, if I deserve it in any way, shape, or form.